<laughs> it appears to have worked <laughs> this time. Thank you. Good evening. My friends, all of you, our uh, foot on down all around the world. It's very nice of you to join us here on this Friday evening, one hour earlier than usual. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. This is Live Irish Myths, episode 79. Tonight, we're continuing with the New Grange theme that has been running all week, and we're indeed continuing from last night's theme, specifically about the pre-excavation folklore and what it told us about the monument. One big thank you uh, today, uh, before we start, is to my good friend Michael Fortune of Folklore.ie. If you saw the graphic for today, you'll see that it's an old image of the front of New Grange pre-excavation. And it was colorized by Michael. Uh, it was a black and white image, and I think it belongs to NMNI, which I think is National Museum of Northern Ireland, um, taken about a century ago or so. And uh, Michael did a fantastic job of, of uh, colorizing some of those images to give us a better idea of what it really looked like back then. So I'm very grateful to Michael for his help and support. Also, uh, just before we get going tonight, probably worthwhile mentioning if there's somebody trolling and posting nasty comments and whatever, it doesn't happen. I think it's only happened twice in 79 episodes. Your best advice I can give you is to ignore them, block them and report them privately uh, so that you don't see them. Uh, but I cannot do anything to get rid of them while the broadcast is ongoing. I can only do that when the broadcast is finished. Don't feed them. Let them do their thing. Uh, these people get satisfaction out of the weirdest things. Uh, in, in, in last night's case, uh, he was obviously booted out by Facebook automatically because I couldn't find his comments afterwards. But just ignore them and he'll go away generally. Anyway, good evening to you all on YouTube this evening. Erica Bow is the first of the commenters. Says Ternonoa Falja, Erica Daisy Peters, who is one of the regular, regular, regulars. Daisy, it's great to see you. Ternonoa uh, says Daisy and same right back to you. Um, <clears throat> uh, who else? Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony and the two are ready for another interesting episode. Well, I'm glad you found all the other episodes interesting and that you keep coming back. That's uh, a good sign, Jackie. L very nice to have you along. Falls you. Uh, Erica Rivertree says, Bannachty, or Louisville, Kentucky. Bannachty, Erica, Irish technical thinker, who's Marcus. And I think it's Rachel. Greetings to all. Ireland was so warm, my face melted off. <laughs> yeah, we're getting a rare spell of dry and sunny weather. Uh, a lot of us aren't complaining. The farmers may be different and may have a different opinion about it. Judith Nylon is in the house. Hey, dear friend, delighted to be here as always. Lovely to see you as always, Judith. Hope you're keeping well. Muradok Makandri says, Jirive Mokara, Falche Muradok. Very nice to have you along. That is a fantastic name. Muradok's Cross in Monaster Boys. Huh? That's about a millennium. Ago, he was the abbot out there. The full Irish says, Happy Friday and fall you and fall you to of fame. Nat's Ghost says, Ah, sweet, sweet respite. Hello, all. Fall you, Nat's Ghost. Michael Donnelly says, Hi to you, Gia Glitch. Michael, pardon me. Jay McHugh, who's Joan in Hoth or Ben Ether, says, Gia Reeve, Mokarja. Gia Glitch, Joan, fall you. Josie Weatherford says, Hello, I'm catching up on part one right now. Oh, that's last night's episode, not episode one. But just want to say hi, just paid my deposit for a UCD postgraduate program in Irish folklore. So this is very interesting. Brilliant stuff, Josie. And the very best of luck with that. On Facebook, Jess McDonald's. McDonaldo. No, Maldonaldo. Jess Maldonaldo says, hi, sir. First of the commenters tonight on Facebook. Falcha, Jess. Jack Durkin says, hi, everyone. Gia Glitch. Red. Oh, oh, Maldonig. Says, hi, Geraldine Maloney in New York. Hello, Geraldine. Falcha. Paula Snow Queen waves. Falcha. Jules Cousins also waves. Gia Glitch. Jules. Beth Amos says, good evening from Abruzzo. Falcha. Beth. Patricia Patsy O'Malley Boyd says, hi, everyone. Gia Glitch. Pa Patricia. Margaret Kiernan says, hi, Anthony. It has been a day of tech problems. Yeah, very interesting. I never saw that before. It said live stream was unavailable. But when I refreshed the page and tried again, it worked. Heather Geron Rice says, having a car picnic with Carol Paul. Brilliant stuff, Heather. Sounds lovely. Margaret Ring is in the house. Fall to Margaret. Good evening. Friday evening. It's time for, I don't have it with me. It's time for a glass of wine. I will have one after we finish the live stream. Connie Keeler says, happy Friday from Ontario in Canada. Fall to Connie. Marcella Logue says, good evening from a sunny Galway city. Spread the sun. Tom Green, a Tottenham Avenue Eru. 
Good evening, Marcella. Karim Gogas is watching. Falcha, Karim. Jess Maldonado says, hello again from Portland, Oregon. Hello indeed. And the West Coasters are immediately well represented. Lexi Erickson says, hi, Gia Glitch. Alwyn Roy Badziak says, hi, Anthony and Tua Falcha. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Barbara Kling says, hi, 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 everyone from hot and humid Vermont. Hope you're all doing well. All doing great. So far, swell. All, all, all on this side anyway, Barbara. Hope you are well too. Snapper Earl says, hello, Gia Glitch. More on the brew. Hurrah. Thanks, Anthony. Love to the Tua, says Aaron Durrett. Brilliant. Dan, Danilo Paparello says, hi, Anthony. Happy Friday from Italy. Oh, I got a message today from Federica Guy, who uh, was a very, very, very regular regular on Mythflix. But he told me that he has moved into the countryside and the broadband's no good, so he can't catch the live streams anymore. But he's catching up during the day. So I just want to qu say a quick ciao to Federica. Hope you're keeping well. Uh, Bear, Bear Whelan, and of course Danilo is also in Italy. Ciao. Burr Whelan says, hi, everyone from sunny Dublin. Seems to be sunny all over Ireland today. Fantastic. Hi, Burr. Doris Sahara says, hello from a sunny and warm Heidelberg. Falche. Tranonawa, Doris. And a good evening also from Amelia O'Connor. Falche, Amelia. Setriga, says Joliet Jake. I don't know what that means. Perhaps you might translate, but you're welcome. It's a terrific pick, says Alwyn. Isn't it fantastic? Angel Barboni Smith says, love to the Tua. Graw more art. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony and all the Tua. I hope everyone in good form. Dram topped up and it's story time. Absolutely. I'll, I'll be topping up a dram or two later on now, I can tell you. I'm finished work. <coughs> well, I'm finished work for the moment. I'll probably end up working tomorrow. Mariana Dunn says, hello, dear Anthony and Tua from Virginia Falls, Jim Mariana. Edina Spark says, good afternoon, Anthony and all. Happy Friday. Happy Jehina. Tulsa fame, uh, Edina. Serena Swift says, busy days, making it when I can. Hello to all. No problem, Serena. I completely understand. Life goes on. It's perfectly okay, but it's very nice of you to join us. Falcha. Laura Salta says, first time watching live. Hello from Massachusetts in the USA. Falcha, Laura Banachti. Grab a chair. Make yourself comfortable. Imagine yourself in a whitewashed cottage on the Atlantic coast of Ireland in front of a roaring hearth surrounded by lots of lovely folk uh, on all uh, drinking tea and eating tato sandwiches <laughs> and a couple of them drinking whiskey and poutine and you'll be made to feel very welcome I'm sure Karam says I also reported that troll as a fake account which they usually are yes indeed good stuff Karam thank you for your help Kelly Minich is watching. Hello, Kelly. Peter Kieran's is watching. Hello, Peter. Good evening to you. Hope you had a good week. Kathy May. Kathy K. McCartney says hello, everyone. Folge, Kathy K. Kimberly Halligan says hi to all. Looking forward to today's session. Welcome on board, Kimberly. Kathy May Dayo says good evening, Mr. Anthony, and all the two. Are sunny again and warm in Newcastle in Washington State. Great to hear it, Kathy. Hope you're keeping well. Welcome along. And it's sunny in a lot of places today. Na Nana Haruni says hello from Armenia. Falcha Nana. You're very welcome along. Yvette Tilima says hi, Anthony, and Mr. Sorry, hi, Tua, and Mr. Murphy. I have an idea for a possible episode. Who were mound builders? And who were mound builders and the Western seaboard theory? not following exactly Yvette. You might uh, flesh that out a little bit for us. Mike Naylor, well, Mike and Jeanette. Hello, Anthony and, and Tribe. Grateful to get one of your New Grange books, Mike and Jeanette in Jersey. Yes, they went really quickly today. Thank you to all the people who ordered books. The New Grange ones are all gone. There's still two or three copies of Mythical Ireland left. If you want one, get over to the website quick and put, put in your order. Kathy May, Kathy K. McCartney said, I've just started watching and I'm enjoying. Brilliant stuff, Kathy. Samira Armas Smith says hello from Dallas, Texas. Falcha, Samira, nice to have Texas in the house. Nick S. Casterton says good evening, Anthony. And the two, a happy Friday to you. Uh, to you all. It's great to be back indeed. And it's lovely to have you back. Hope you spoiled her rotten yesterday, uh, Nick. Can I remember her name? I can't. Sorry. Margaret says, good evening, Anthony, and all the lovely Tua. And same to yourself, Margaret. I hope you have one in the hand. Maeve Fina Callahan says, hello, Tua. Bright and sunny here in Portland, Oregon. Told you, all the West Coasters. They just love this in the morning to well at noontime. Actually, it is. It's 11. It's just after 11 there, isn't it? Hi, everybody. From Taranto in Italy, says Andrea Lagoya. Hello, Andrea. 
Ciao to you. Movanway Millward says, turn on a walk to a very hot gear in Bristol. I might need to jump in the garden pond if it carries on like this. I have a lot of myth flicks to catch up on, on from this week. Good to join you. And it's great to have you along, Movanway. Welcome back. Raymond Lawson says, bonjour. Bonjour indeed, Raymond. Mon ami. I'm here says Lucy, finally clicked the 7 p.m. start time on a Friday. Also managed to remember, it's Friday. Gia Gritch, Anthony on the tour. Gorgeous evening in Devon. I don't know if you're like the rest of us, Lucy, but with the, way, with the lockdown and working from home all the time, uh, I have tended to find it difficult to ascertain what day of the week it is sometimes. So it's totally understandable. Train on the Irk, lovely musician, says hello to a cup of tea is prepared and I'm ready for another great evening with the tour. Fall to Trina. Patrick Moore says, hi, Fulcher Patrick, the name of a very famous astronomer who was a great inspiration to me and many other astronomers when I was younger. The late, great Patrick Moore. Raymond Lawson says, hello, Gia Gritch. Raymond Lloyd Stilwell says, hello, from water-soaked Missouri. Well, that's an unusual one because all the rest of us are basking in the sun. So our sympathies to you, Lloyd. Uh, perhaps you could send a mil millimeter or two of rain in our direction. Long T Menno C says, Friday, felicitations to Anthony and the Mythflix community. Fall to Long T. <laughs> Kathy Kay says, yummy wine and hello from Ohio. <laughs> Sarah Finn says, Geogritch, Geogritch, Sarah, I presume you're in Canada. Looks like a Canadian flag. Federica Guy says, hi, Anthony. Hi, too. Happy to be here again. Love from Italy. Ah, and I thought well, we weren't going to see you. There you go. You must have got your broadband. You must, you must be sitting on the roof or something. It's lovely to see you. Ciao. Veronica Gay Casey says, hi, everyone. Falce Veronica Connors at all, too. Ralph Waldron says, just remembered, it is Friday already. Correct. Declan McDonough says, hi, from Dura. Falcha Declan. Henry Paddy Shearman is in the house, says, hi, everyone. Falcha Henry. Michael Maher is watching. Connors at all, too. Michal Macharja. I hope you are nicely ensconced, probably in the garden with your feet up and a glass of vino in the hand. That's how I picture it anyway. Peter Kieran says, hello from the far side. Long running. I've explained this one before. Long running. Uh, thing between the two sides of Drogheda on either side of the Boyne. I can't get involved in that one because when I was born, I lived on the south side and then I grew up on the north side and now I live on the south side again. So I've been kind of on both far sides. <laughs> hello, Peter. Hope you and all yours are keeping well. Alex Casterton says, hello all and Anthony. Another scorching day in Albion. Volja, Alex. Work, Anthony. Go on. Sure, Margaret, don't you know I work all the time and there's this thing that I do between work called... Catch, catching 40 winks <laughs> Martin Dohany says Ternonawa Anthony Augustua looking forward to tonight's episode hope we can uh, appease your delights Martin Christina Zaba says hi second time here good evening from Bristol England where we've heard from another Brist Bristolian Brist yes Bristolian maybe that it is hot and sunny over there so hope you're enjoying it Christina Lucy Robinson says, Tato sandwiches, that takes me back. What about Denny Rashers, huh? Dave Russell says, hi all. Yes, Anthony, it's hard to believe 1990 was 30 years ago. I know, I know. Like that's to me just seems like yesterday, you know? It's a lifetime away, apparently. If you don't have good Wi-Fi on countryside, the clouds of blood will come to you, says Kerem. <laughs> Quoting from Togal Brunya da Derga. The destruction of that Derga's hostel. Adele Mary says, Hey, watching from Slade, brilliant stuff, Adele. Falje, oh, a bolly slonya, falje gudi, drahidaha, a glan the bonya. Patricia McAteer is watching. Good evening, Patricia. Debbie Daly says, Hi, Anthony and Tua from beautifully cloudy San Jose, California. Beautifully cloudy. You see, they do proper clouds over there. Nice to have you along, Debbie. Kelly Edmiston is here. Hello, Kelly. Greetings to uh, and my tribe, Anthony. Any comment for me on Marginaria and cartoons? Uh, other than I would have to do a research for that, Kelly, because it's not an area that I have any expertise in. If you can point me to sources, brilliant, uh, because I'd rather read something than have to go and spend days researching it. Uh, you know yourself. I don't have the time. That's the problem. Kelly Young says... Walhalla, South Carolina. Good evening, Kelly. Folja, good morning to you. Also from Texas is Aaron Cuive i Higin. Aaron Conasatatu, Folja. You're welcome. Regina Riley says hello. It is a perfect evening for a cold Bulmers. Slauncha. Absolutely. Now, uh, you'll have to imagine that this is Bulmers. It is, in fact, a rare substance called H2O. And during the 
during the debate about whether Irish people should pay water charges or not, uh, one of our politicians said, you know, water doesn't fall from the sky, you know. <laughs> In Ireland, it falls from the sky almost every day of the year, except for at the moment, as I said, we're having a bit of a drought. Kim Kleinheinz Velker says, hello from Nashville. Falsha, Kim, good evening to you. Felis. Felicia Felix says, nice to see you again from New England in the USA. Good evening, Felicia. Trononawa. Lisa Collins says, happy Friday from Minnesota. Good evening to you, Lisa Folge. Barbara Murphy, always a great joy to have another Murphy in Chokwaraku. Hello, can't wait for more spine tingling info as I hide inside from an expected 208 degrees. 44.2 Celsius, hottest day so far in Tucson, Arizona. That's about 11 degrees warmer than it's ever been anywhere in Ireland. Since the volcanic era, that is. <laughs> but you're welcome along, Barbara. Climb in the icebox and shut the door. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Everybody's in good form, which is great. Gina Locke says, hello, Gia Glitch. Robin Edgar says, bonjour from Montreal. Bonsoir, mon ami Robin. Con uh, I, I was going to start trying to speak French, but I realised that all I can say in French is uh, les carigots. And uh, les petits pois, uh, and little bits and pieces like that, you know. Où est le livre, s'il vous plaît? Evening, says Sai B. Falsha Sai. It's okay, Anthony. My missus is well spoiled. Brilliant, Nick. Delighted to hear it. Patrick Moore says he's in Essex. Where was the other Patrick Moore? Was he Sussex? Was he Selsey? No, where was that? Selsey. You, you may be able to tell me that. Patrick, you have a famous name. It's great to have you. Paul Garron who rescued the whole situation with the books, the hero of the Mythflix tour this week, says, good evening all, tour membership and Anthony inclusion. Ratoth says hello. Oh, I did get your email or your message, Paul. I just didn't get time to respond about two ha. Yes, we are a funny bunch. Kirsten Boyster says hi from Northern Germany, Hamburg. Kirsten, it's great to have you along, Falje. Anne Garrity Smith. Hello, Anne. Nice to see you again. Jirive digging and listening. <laughs> are you an archaeologist? <laughs> what are you better? Perhaps better that you don't tell us what you're digging. Vicky, Vicky Wallace Suttle says, hello, my lovely friend, Folge. Vicky, lovely to see you again. And if Evan is with you, hello, Evan. Hope you are in good form. Laura O'Reilly says, hello from Madrid. Wish I was home. Laura, there's lots of Irish people who wish they were in Madrid. So I suppose there could be a whole exchange of places going on. But look, we are where we are. And uh, I consider myself very lucky to be in the Boyne Valley, uh, which is, as you know, the centre of the universe. But Madrid, second best place, perhaps. Does that make you feel better? If not, I'm sorry. But yeah, look, the planes are starting to fly again, so it won't be too long. Alyssa Johnston Glassell says greetings from Virginia. Falcha, Alyssa. Maura Farrell Miller is in the house. Hello, Maura. Mike Michaela Lewis says. Hi, all. It's boiling here in Donegal. Well, turn off the kettle. <laughs> good evening, Michaela. It's good to hear that the weather is fine. Patricia McAteer says hello from Omid. Falsha, Patricia, as always nice to see you in the house. Veronica Casey says, yes, Bristolian. I am a Swindonian. Lol. <laughs> I'm a Drahedian. There you go. <laughs> Greetings from Jupiter, says Maura. Wow. But it's not the planet. It's Jupiter, Florida. I didn't know there was a Jupiter in Florida. I knew there was a Cape Canaveral. But there you go, Maura. You're very welcome. Don't say where I'm from, says Gina Locke. It's embarrassing at this point. Okay. I forget where you're from, so maybe I won't anyway. Dawn Hilton says, hi, Anthony. Lots of love to everyone. Falsha, Dawn. Margaret Ring is counting viewers. Great stuff. I can't scroll up to the early message, but thank you, Nick Eska Casterton. Much better now. Herbalist is sorting me out. Plant power is the way forward. TGIF from McGovern's in Hicksville, New York. And that's from Maggie. Falcha Maggie and the McGovern's in New York. It's lovely to see you this evening. Ali McCroskey Park says, hello. My first time here, raining in North Carolina. Ali, you're welcome along. Pull up a, a stool, sit by the fire and grab a dram. Or if if you want something lighter, a, a brew will do fine. And uh, make, yourself, make yourself at home. Michaela Lewis says, good old Ishka. Yes. Dawn is making dinner while watching. Good stuff. Will you stop watching when you're eating? Kelly Edmiston is smashing pints together. Good stuff. Get one down yet. Oshin, Oshin Lally says drought is good for drones. Hello. Indeed it is, Oshin Falch. It's good to see you. Laura O'Reilly says up the dubs. I would say up the wee county. But first of all, I have no interest in GAA. And second of all, 
how should I say this? I have to be very diplomatic. There could be fans watching our, our Gaelic team. They're not renowned for winning trophies. <laughs> Somebody's going to take offense at that. I apologize. Miriam Magod says, hello from France. Bonsoir, Miriam. Nice to have you along. Cindy Daniels Graven is watching. Hello, Cindy. Pat Rowan is watching. And Pat is in Washington State. Okay, anyone else that we have missed? Lou Abu says the Woodsies in Monster Boys. Absolutely. But uh, I wish they'd start winning something and then maybe I'd start supporting them. Fair weather supporter that I am. What are we on? Let's call it 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Wow. Incredible stuff. This evening, we are returning to the theme that we were on last night, which is in, in relation to pre-excavation mythology, folklore, and writing about Newgrange. What can it tell us? What can it tell us? Uh, what did the excavations then show of the pre-excavation folklore and mythology and writing that was true? And did it show any of it to be false? Furthermore, tonight, we're going to talk about archaeologists, and one in particular, and uh, I don't make a habit of slagging off archaeologists because a lot of them are good friends of mine. And we agree to disagree on some things, and we agree to agree on others. And uh, We haven't got discussions about certain things, for instance, you know, as to whether Louth will ever win the uh, All-Ireland Championship again. We don't even go there. So uh, tonight I'm going to read one one from my own work and then one from another work which I'll keep uh, Erica River Tree. We'll keep that one. We'll keep the powder dry on that one for a little while. Tonight I'm reading from chapter 1.5 of Mythical Ireland, New Light in the Ancient Past. Uh, seven or eight of you uh, will be receiving copies of that in the post, uh, hopefully early to middle to the middle of next week, depending on, on how long your post is taking. For those of you in Australia, I hate to tell you, well, maybe it's the maybe it's not so bad uh, from Ireland to Australia. I ordered a book from Australia on the 8th of May, uh, which is three weeks ago today, and it is still in transit. So uh, hopefully, uh, if you're in Australia, uh, we'll get our uh, envelopes and parcels to you quicker than they are coming in the opposite direction. And this chapter is titled, controversially, you ready for this? Oh, I want to make sure I'm, my, my comments aren't scrolling. I want to make sure I haven't missed any. Jules' cousin says, yeah, I got my book today. Brilliant stuff, Jules. Looking forward to hearing about how you enjoy it. Laura O'Reilly says, five in a row. Yes, indeed. Just hopped on, says Donna Firer. Uh, we've never won five. I think we won three. There you go. And the last one was 1957. I need speakers in my kitchen, says Don Hilton. Come on, Tua. Sort her out there. Get her some speakers. Okay, I'm going to ignore that one. I love your French, says Miriam. Jean <laughs> Petit, un petit peu. So it's called The Archaeologist Who Unwisely Dismissed Newgrange Folklore. And as I say, I don't make a habit of slagging archaeologists. Are you all comfortable? Jim Conway is in the house. Fall to Jim. Connors a talk to. Jez Hunt says, evening postmaster and everyone catching love for a change, drawing footwork for tooling into, not work, for tooling into a sword scabbard. Wow, sounds like an interesting uh, endeavour and the very best of luck with it. Austin Davies, if I didn't say, already says hi all. Uh, good evening to you. The earliest antiquarians who visited, documented, sketched and spoke about Newgrange after its rediscovery in 1699 sometimes get a hard time from the modern academic establishment. The writings of Cloyd and Molyneux and Pownall and Valency are all criticised for one reason or another, in brackets, Poor Charles Valency is largely ridiculed, perhaps because he referred to Newgrange as a Mithraic temple. Close bracket. All of the early antiquarian accounts of the monument are valuable for one reason or another. Some of them, so folks, just to, just to remind you, uh, if we see any spammers or trolls, please do not feed them. Just report them, block them and hide them. That's the very best thing you can do. Some of them have captured aspects of Newgrange that have disappeared since they wrote. Without the tools and techniques of modern archaeology, all of them were poking around in the dark, so to speak. 
They couldn't have known the true age of Newgrange, nor could they have appreciated the skills of the artists and builders who created it, those whom they all too often referred to as barbarous. And I think that the classic example of that line of sort of Victorian era or Georgian era thinking uh, was uh, uh, Steve uh, Ferguson, James Ferguson, whose book was called Rude Stone Monuments. However, Dr. Glyn Daniel, lecturer in archaeology at Cambridge University and editor of the academic journal Antiquity, perhaps should have known better. In 1964, Daniel's book Newgrange and the Bend of the Boyne was published. It had been a collaborative effort with University College Cork Professor of Archaeology, Sean P. O'Reardon, who has been mentioned in a couple of previous episodes. Sadly, O'Reardon had passed away in 1957 in his early 50s, when the pair were only halfway through completion of the book. Daniel was the general editor of the Ancient Peoples and Places series of books under which the Newgrange title was published. It was to become the largest single study of the Newgrange Monument since George Coffey's 1912 book and would be the last before Professor Michael J. O'Kelly's excavations at Newgrange revealed so many of its secrets. Margaret is keeping a good, a good count on things. Good stuff, Margaret. One of the shortcomings of the Daniel slash O'Reardon book is that it fails to deal in any substantial terms with the mythical history of the Newgrange Monument or indeed its counterparts in the Bend of the Boyne. Except for one passage in which he relates that Newgrange might be an English corruption of on Uev Grainne, the cave of Grainne, Daniel does not discuss the ancient names of Newgrange or its import in the early texts as O'Kelly later did in his own work on Newgrange. And by the way, in relation to that contention that Newgrange is a corruption of on Uev Grainne, meaning the Cave of the Sun, or on Uev Grainne, the Cave of Grainne, uh, that, that has, I think, been firmly put to bed. That is, that is not substantiated at all. Failing to acknowledge the earlier Irish names of Newgrange, some stone monuments are quite rude, says Robin. <laughs> well, we spoke about that, didn't we? Yes. Failing to acknowledge the earlier Irish names of Newgrange and its mythology and associated stories, Daniel falls into a trap. He assumes the folklore about the site to be utter fantasy and dismisses it as such. And this is a quote. Uh, and, and that book, by the way, I'm just going to go to the end notes because I just want to make sure that where appropriate, I will refer you to the work that's being quoted from. This is from O'Reardon, uh, O'Reardon and Daniel. Uh, and just so that you can have a look at the book in question. Whoever put those lights up wasn't very good at his job. Uh, this is the book. Thames and Hudson logo on the front. Newgrange, S.P. O'Reardon, and Dan Glyn Daniel. And Newgrange and the Bend of the Boyne. 70 photographs, 28 line drawings, 8 maps. And that's published in 1964. And that's actually a very, very fine copy of the book. It's in great, great nick. <laughs> Anyway, let's progress with the story a little bit. This is, this is a quote from that book. It is natural that impressive monuments like Newgrange and Stonehenge should be visited a great deal by the general public and should themselves have attracted a folklore based on imagination, half-forgotten history, unappreciated archaeology, and the sort of nonsense that luxuriates in the lunatic fringes of serious archaeology. So there you go. He's kind of laying, laying out his stall here, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> and as I say, um, as I always say, and the rest is prehistory. And in that foregoing paragraph, Daniel was just setting himself up for a fall. Rowan Grove says, arriving late, I lost track of what day we're in. We were talking about that, Rowan, before you came on. 
So many of us have lost track of time. Uh, I'm working from home all the time and I'm finding it difficult to ascertain what day of the week it is. I have to ask, even my family doesn't know, I have to ask strangers who are passing in the street, socially uh, distanced, of course. Excuse me, sir, can you tell me what day of the week it is? Because I haven't got Google for that sort of thing. And here's another paragraph from uh, the Daniel book. The visitor to Newgrange and Douth will not be surprised to be told that these monuments were built by and were the homes of the little people or to be asked their connection with the Druids. One should always be careful, this is me speaking, about dismissing the fairy folk, even if one is a leading archaeologist and expert of the times. Now, I hope you don't find this. I, I, I didn't mean to denigrate the man's reputation. He's not here to defend himself. Uh, and I certainly didn't mean to... Um, uh, to make little of him. However, there is a serious argument here, and I think you, you'll, you'll get the gist of it now in a moment. But the following is perhaps indicative of the excessively arrogant attitude of Daniel in dealing with a monument such as Newgrange. In his impetuous haste to dismiss the folklore, he dismissed also notions about the site that would later transpire to be based in truth. A coloured calendar, this is a quote again from the same book from Newgrange and the Bend of the Boyne by Glyn Daniel and Sean P. O'Reardon. A coloured Friday night drinks, this sounds like a great idea. Can we uh, can we all just shout to the barman and say, you know, give us a round? But, uh, who, who's, who's round is it though? <laughs> I shouldn't go there, should I? But the following is perhaps indicative. Yes, 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 yes. In his impetuous haste to dismiss the folklore, he also dismissed notions about the site that would later transpire to be based in truth. And here's a quote. A coloured calendar current in Ireland in 1960, and remember this is two years before Professor O'Kelly's excavations began, had in it a good photograph of the decorated stone at the entrance to New Grange. So he starts with a compliment, a good photograph. This was accompanied by an account which needs quoting almost in total as an example of the jumble of nonsense and wishful thinking indulged in by those who prefer the pleasures of the irrational and the joys of unreason to the hard thinking that archaeology demands. Quote, and so he's quoting here from the calendar. The entrance in the east was originally triangular, says this description, but is now changed for easy entrance. Formerly, it was necessary to crawl in and progress was retarded by interference. The stones, pardon me, stones compelling the neophyte to stoop and stumble. Margaret says, do you remember rounds? You mean rounds in the pub? It's not that long ago. <laughs> I remember having to go to the toilet when it was mine, my round. <laughs> Joke. The rays of the... I'm just saying I'm not buying for 145 people. I just want to make that. There's 31 watching on YouTube. I'm not buying for 190 people. 180, my maths isn't that good, as you can tell. The rays of the rising sun at certain times of the year penetrate the opening and rest on a remarkable triple spiral carving in the central chamber. Now, remember, folks, this is pre-excavation. And the restoration and the first viewing in modern times of the light in Newgrange didn't happen until 1967, which was three years after the Glyn Daniel uh, Sean P. O'Reardon book was published. Like the Great Pyramid of Giza at, New at Egypt, the Newgrange Temple was originally covered with a layer of white quartz and was a brilliant object of light for a considerable distance. Nuda, it's spelled here N U D A, but presumably Nuada. First king of the Tua de Danon in Ireland, and that is correct, he was the first king according to the mythology, and his master magician are said to have officiated here in the very, very old days. Artemidorus the Ephesian stated, To sacred Ierne of the Hibernians, men go to learn more of the mysteries of Samothrace. And that is the end of the quote. So you can see here, Ruth Ann says, Hello everyone, Jigwich Ruth Falche. You can see here, can't you, that uh, he, he's not exactly uh, respectful of the traditions of Newgrange. Two very important statements in this 1960 calendar. Padraig O'Comiskey is watching Falcha Porig. Good evening to you. Connors to talk to. Hope you're well. I hope you're taking loads, loads of nice photographs in that fabulous weather. 
Two very important statements in this 1960 calendar demonstrate that there were enduring traditions about Newgrange that were fascinating and even compelling and certainly worthy of at least some investigation. One, that the sun shone into the chamber during the year. And the other, that the monument may once have been covered in white quartz. Understandably, Daniel could have not, not have known about the existence of quartz, given that the O'Kelly excavations at Newgrange had just begun when the, when the Daniel O'Reardon book was published. But there was at least one possible reference to this feature in mythology, the white-topped brew, which was said to have been brilliant to approach. Now, uh, I, I did mention, I think, last night or in recent nights, uh, I just want to see what... Sorry, what... Oh, yeah. The, the one about the white-top brew being brilliant to approach is actually from Newgrange Monument to Immortality, page 114. Uh, but what's interesting here is the fact that... And Ken Williams was the first one to draw my attention to this, was the fact that um, uh, in the pre-excavation days, there were some pieces of quartz visible on the ground. So it's not that all of it was concealed at the bottom of the cairn slip, just that most of it was. Furthermore, he was doubtless aware that the westernmost of the hills of Loch Crew, with its smattering of ancient chambered cairns, was Carn Bawn, meaning the White Cairn. If he had been a bit more familiar with some of the mythology of Newgrange, he might not have been so quick to dismiss it. And of course, the big problem here is, uh, you know, this, this whole attitude that prevailed at a certain time, uh, that basically it was only the rational mind that could solve the puzzle of the past. And we now know that there's a huge amount of create creativity and, and uh, uh, probably a huge element of the intuitive mind actually went into the construction of these monuments. These people were clearly driven by, uh, you know, some form of intense spirituality, some form of religious experience. Uh, you, you couldn't say, you could not say, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, I can't remember that quote that I read from one of the Newgrange uh, Monument Immortality chapters the other night, that you can't go to Newgrange and come away from it without having that feeling of something deeper and something, you know, something that has moved people spiritually, not just a mere sum of its contents and a sum of its stones. It is not merely a heap of stone and earth uh, heaped together carelessly by some grunting barbarians of the past, as I always say. You know, it was very carefully and lovingly constructed uh, and for uh, probably numerous reasons that were very, very deep and deeply held. Paul Blockley says, Uh good evening, Paul, how are you? But Daniel certainly should have not should not have been so dismissive in relation to the solar alignment, especially as it had been previously suggested by the likes of Solar Physics Observatory Director Sir Norman Lockyer in 1909 and W.Y. evans Vents in the fairy faith in the Celtic countries in 1911. Within three years or so of the publication of the Daniel slash O'Reardon book, Professor Michael O'Kelly would stand in the chamber of Newgrange and become the first person in the modern era and perhaps since the Bronze Age to witness the winter solstice sunlight streaming into its inner chamber, illuminating by reflected light the, tr the triscal or triple spiral in the chamber. Uh, Megan Walter says archaeologists still have night terrors over the word ritual. I, I wrote about that in Drone Hinge, and I hope that I didn't sort of, I hope that I didn't go overboard. I nearly quoted just for the laugh, but uh, yeah, I, I had a, I had a page in one of the chapters about this word ritual and and you know how it can be uh, abused. You know, John McGovern is watching. Fault you, John. I might do that. Remind me when I'm finished this chapter. I might I might quickly grab the John Henge book. What time are we on? Oh, we mightn't have time for that, but we'll keep going. During his excavations at the famous monument, O'Kelly would uncover a significant layer of quartz beneath the cairn spill material. Quartz that he would later demonstrate through repeated experiment that actually fronted the monument. In other words, at the very least, Newgrange had a white quartz facade and it is not such a leap of imagination that the cairn was once covered with this bright stone, as hinted at in the aforementioned mythology. Catherine Anderson says, I went inside Newgrange in 2003. It was amazing. 
I was supposed to take my eldest niece, niece there earlier this month. I look forward to seeing it again when the world is better. Absolutely, Catherine. We look forward to welcoming you to the Boyne Valley when that happens. One wonders what Daniel made of O'Kelly's re revelations and how it might have altered his thinking in relation to folklore. Folk memory is a very powerful thing. This might have been demonstrated in the case of the story in the locality of Newgrange, suggesting that the morning star, Venus, shone into the chamber of the monument once every eight years, as recorded by Joseph Campbell. Then there was the folklore collected in 1938, and we mentioned this last night, that suggested that Tuatha Danann had built Newgrange using stones brought from the Mourne Mountains, another apparently wild and imaginative claim that had some basis in reality. Even in the claim that Nuda officiated at Newgrange, the calendar was not too far off the mark. In the early texts, Newgrange is associated in particular with Elkmar, Dagda and Angus. Dagda was the chief of the gods, a king of the Tuatha Danann, so to speak, and Elkmar was described as a magician and original master of Brunebonia. The Nuda mentioned in the calendar is undoubtedly Nuadu, the king of the Tuatha Danann who led them into Ireland. Nuadu was, according to the late Dahi O'Hogan, Associate Professor of Irish Folklore at University College Dublin, one and the same deity as Elkmar. In early Irish tradition, Nuadu was associated with the Boyne, being married to the eponymous goddess of the river, Boyn. He was displaced through a trick from his residence at Brunebonia, the New Grange Tumulus, by the Makog, i.e. Angus, and went to live at the nearby place called She Kletchik, or Kletchik as we've referred to it. Unfortunately, and this is me speaking again, I can only challenge Mr. Daniel posthumously. As he is not here to defend himself, I must not take undue license in criticising him for his sweeping dismissal of the folk beliefs as related in the 1960 calendar, only to say that almost everything related by that calendar turned out to have a basis in truth. I am glad that this diminution of folklore is not ubiquitous among modern archaeologists. As mentioned above, Michael O'Kelly outlined the mythical importance of Newgrange and seemed to have a great reverence for the site and acknowledged the possibility that it was a house of the dead and an abode of spirits, which he said was a concept not contradicted by the findings of his excavation. O'Kelly felt that a connection between the archaeological evidence and the early literature was to be found in the older and, quote, more genuine tradition, unquote. Daniel allowed only one statement in the 1960 calendar to stand. Quote, it is at least true in this strange wildcat account we have just quoted that Newgrange might well be described as belonging to the very, very old days, unquote. It is our object in this book, he continued, not only to describe the great tombs in the bend of the Boyne, but to set them in what appears to us to their, their true prehistoric context. As far as the limitations of archaeology allow, eschewing the little people and Artemidorus. The O'Kelly, this is the, that's the end of the quote, the O'Kelly excavations came at the end of the 60 year custodianship of the monument by local woman Anne Hickey, who was featured in yesterday's graphic at the entrance of Newgrange. Interviewed by RTE Television in 1962 at the age of 90. She said that the old people considered Newgrange a, quote, place for fairies and you dream about them, unquote. She added that people were quite terrified of them and that if anyone was seen walking around the mound at night, it was a sign that something was going to happen to us. The fairies were a very real presence up until the time of the excavations. One eschews the Dina she at one's peril. And of course, Mrs. Hickey also recounted a mysterious meeting at Newgrange with a white woman who vanished while she was speaking to her. Uh, and you can see that. That's in the RTE archives. Uh, let me just see if I can get that. Newgrange RTE archive. If I can get that, that's worth watching when we're finished. Um, because the uh, excavation, yes, the excavation, the interview took place. Uh, and of course, he interviewed Professor O'Kelly as well. The interview took place at uh, the, 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 basically, the, I think in the first year of the excavations, it was 1962. My apologies. The itchy nose is, is uh, causing me grief again. So I'm just going to paste that in 
as a comment I have done on YouTube. I'll paste it in here as a comment uh, on this video here on Facebook as well. So watch that afterwards. It's very interesting. Some people have said that they find it very difficult to make out what Mrs. Hickey is saying. She's a very, very thick local accent. She is speaking English, but of course a colloquial version of same. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Now, if you're not already familiar with it, again, later, uh, after the, uh, uh, the broadcast has finished, I invite you to watch a version of what I'm about to read. And what I'm about to read, many of you will be familiar with, but some of you will never have heard it before. I'm about to read from a short story compiled in 1897 by the very famous Irish writer, mystic uh, uh, and uh, uh, a great uh, Celtic revivalist, George William Russell, known also as A.E. The tale is called A Dream of Angus Og. Uh, and so without spoiling it too much, what I can tell you about it before I read it is that because it was written uh, at the end of the 19th century and therefore 65 years before the excavations of Newgrange began and 70 years before the solstice illumination was confirmed because it couldn't have been witnessed before that because of the subsidence of the monument. And that's something we'll be talking about tomorrow in my episode about the reconstruction, the excavation and reconstruction of Newgrange. So this is called A Dream of Angus Oak by George William Russell. I'm going to read the whole thing and I hope you enjoy it. The day had been wet and wild and the woods looked dim and drenched from the window where Con sat. All the day long, his ever restless feet were running to the door in a vain hope of sunshine. That's how it is in Ireland quite a lot of the time. His sister, Nora, to quiet him, had told him over and over again the tales which delighted him, the delight of hearing which was second only to the delight of living them over himself. When, as Cúchulán, he kept the ford which led to Ulla, his soul, hero heart, matching the hosts of Maeve, or as Fergus, he wielded the sword of light the druids made and gave to the champion, which in its sweep shore away the crests of the mountains. Or as Brian, the ill-fated child of Turin, he went with his brothers in the ocean-sweeping boat farther than ever Columbus travelled, winning one by one in dire conflict with kings and enchanters the treasures which would appease the implacable heart of Lou. He had just died in a corner of the room from his many wounds when Nora came in declaring that all these famous heroes must go to bed. He protested in vain, but indeed he was sleepy. And before, him, before he had been carried halfway to the room, the little soft face drooped with half-closed eyes while he drowsily rubbed his nose upon her shoulder in an effort to keep him awake. For a while she flitted about him, looking with her dark, shadowy hair flickering in the dim, silver light, like one of the beautiful heroines of Gaelic romance, or one of the twilight race of the she. Before going, she sat by his bed and sang to him some verses of a song set to an old Celtic air whose low intonations were full of half-soundless mysteries. Mystery. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Over the hilltops, the gay lights are peeping down in the vale where the dim fleeces astray. Ceases the smoke from the hamlet up creeping. Come thou, my shepherd, and lead me away. Tracy O'Connor is watching. Fall to Tracy. How are you keeping? Uh, better late than ever. Yeah, not to worry. You've just arrived at the perfect time. You will enjoy this, and I know you've probably heard it before. Federica wants to know the title of the book you're reading. It is, uh, well, it's a, a modern reprint of Imaginations and Reveries uh, by George William Russell. Uh, can I tell you when that was originally published? The whole collection? 1915. But I, I'm pretty sure that A Dream of Angus Og was compiled in 1897. Who's the shepherd, said the boy, suddenly sitting up. Hush, Alana, I will tell you another time. She continued still more softly. Lord of the wand, draw forth from the darkness. Warp of the silver and woof of the gold. Leave the poor shade there bereft in its darkness. Wrapped in the fleece, we will enter the fold. 
There from the many orbed heart where the mother breathes forth the love on her darlings who roam. We will send dreams to their land of another, land of the shining, their birthplace and home. I think uh, Russell was a wonderfully uh, romantic poet, uh, wonderfully evocative of this whole uh, revitalization and rejuvenation and rebirth of the myth of the myths of the ancient myths that he was so uh, 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 central to uh, uh, reviving. He would have asked a hundred questions, but she bent over him, enveloping him with a sudden nightfall of hair to give him his goodnight kiss and departed. Immediately the boy sat up again, all his sleepiness gone. The pure, gay, delicate spirit of childhood was darting at ideas dimly perceived in the delicious moonlight of romance, which silvered his brain, where many airy and beautiful figures were moving. The Fianna with floating locks chasing the flying deer. Shapes more solemn, vast and misty, guarding the avenues to unspeakable secrets. But he steadily pursued this idea. His idea, sorry, his idea. I guess he's one of the people who take you away to fairyland. Wonder if he'd come to me. Think it's easy going away with an intuitive perception of the frailty of the link binding childhood to earth in its dreams. As a man, Con will strive with passionate intensity to regain that free gay motion in the upper airs. Think I'll try if he'll come, and he sang with as near an approach as he could make to the glimmering cadences of his sister's voice. Come thou my shepherd and lead me away. He then lay back quite still and waited. He could not say whether hours or minutes had passed or whether he had slept or not until he was aware of a tall, golden bearded man standing by his bed. Wonderfully light was this figure, as if the sunlight ran through his limbs. A spiritual beauty was on the face and those strange eyes of bronze and gold with their subtle, intense gaze made Con aware for the first time of the difference between inner and outer in himself. Come, Con, come away, the child seemed to hear, uttered silently. You're the shepherd, said Con. I'll go. Then suddenly, I won't come back and be old, and they're all dead. <laughs> A vivid remembrance of Ushian's fate flashing upon him. A most beautiful laughter, which again to Con seemed half soundless, came in reply. His fears vanished. The golden bearded man stretched a hand over him for a moment, and he found himself out in the night, now clear and starlit. Together they moved on as if borne by the wind, past many woods and silver gleaming lakes and mountains which shone like a range of opals below the purple skies. The shepherd stood still for a moment by one of these hills, and there flew out, river-like, a melody mingled with the twinkling as of innumerable elfin hammers. And there was a sound of many gay voices where an unseen people were holding festival, or enraptured hosts who were let loose for the awakening, the new day which was to dawn. For the delighted child felt that fairyland was come over again with its heroes and battles. Sorry, I just need to make a very quick adjustment to the YouTube camera. I do apologise. Our brothers rejoice, said the shepherd to Con. Who are they? asked the boy. They are the thoughts of our father. May we go in? Con asked, for he was fascinated by the melody, mystery, and flashing lights. Alan May says hi all. Giggich, Alan. Not now. We are going to my home where I lived in the days past, when there came to me many kings and queens of ancient era, many heroes and beautiful women who longed for the druid wisdom we taught. And did you fight like Finn and carry spears as tall as trees? 
and chase the deer through the woods and have feasting and singing. Dog singing we're going to have now. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, Coda chooses his moments, doesn't he? No, we, the Danons, did none of these things. But those who were weary of battle and to whom feast and song brought no pleasure came to us and passed hence to a more wonderful land, a more immortal land than this. And this is the bit that you'll be familiar with from the video. As he spoke, he paused before a great mound, grown over with trees, and around it, silver clear in the moonlight, were immense stones piled, the remains of an original circle. And there was a dark, low, narrow entrance leading within. He took Con by the hand, and in an instant they were standing in a lofty cross-shaped cave built roughly of huge stones. I'm hoping you recognise this description. This was my palace. In days past, many a one plucked here the purple flower of magic and the fruit of the tree of life. It is very dark, said the child disconsolately. He had expected something different. Nay, but look, you will see it is the palace of a god. And even as he spoke, a light began to glow and to pervade the cave and to obliterate the stone walls and the antique hieroglyphs engraven thereon and to melt the earthen floor into itself like a fiery sun suddenly uprisen within the world. And there was every, everywhere a wandering ecstasy of sound. Light and sound were one. Light had a voice and the music hung glittering in the air. Look how the sun is dawning for us, ever dawning. In the earth, in our hearts, with ever youthful and triumphant voices. Your sun is but a smoky shadow, ours the ruddy and eternal glow. Yours is far away, ours is heart and hearth and home. Yours is a light without, ours a fire within, in rock, in river, in plain, everywhere living, everywhere dawning, whence also it cometh that the mountains emit their wondrous rays. As he spoke, he seemed to breathe the brilliance of that mystical sunlight and to dilate and tower so that the child looked up to a giant pillar of light, having in his heart a sun of ruddy gold which shed its blinding rays about him. And over his head, there was a waving of fiery plumage and on his face an ecstasy of beauty and immortal youth. I am Angus, Kong Con heard. Men call me the young. I am the sunlight in the heart, the moonlight in the mind. I am the light at the end of every dream, the voice forever calling to come away. I am the desire beyond joy or tears. Come with me, come with me. I will make you immortal. For my palace opens into the gardens of the sun. And there are the fire fountains which quench the heart's desire in rapture. And in the child's dream, he was in a palace high as the stars with dazzling pillars, jewelled like the dawn, and all fashioned out of living and trembling opal. And upon their thrones sat the Danon gods with their scepters and diadems of rainbow light, and upon their faces infinite wisdom and imperishable youth. In the turmoil and growing chaos of his dream, 
he heard a voice crying out. You remember, Con, Con, Connor Amore. You remember. And in an instant, he was torn from himself and had grown vaster and was with the immortals, seated upon their thrones, they looking upon him as a brother. And he was flying away with them into the heart of the gold when he awoke. The spirit of childhood dazzled with the vision, which is too lofty for princes. What does one say? Except, I think Russell was actually closer to the source of all of this than anyone has ever been. So just to remind you, that is called Imaginations and Re Reveries or Reveries. You may get an original. I have a, an original copy of The Candle of Vision. Um, occasionally you find these in secondhand bookshops. That was 45 euros. But the reprints are available online. And, and I think this is, this is what we call, uh, it is a facsimile reprint. In other words, it's a scan and a reprint of the pages in exactly the old text. All I can do after that is all I can do is breathe. I actually find it so powerful that I'm, I'm speechless. All I can say is I wish I could write prose like that. It's fabulous. And this was 60 years before O'Kelly stood in that chamber. And I wonder if O'Kelly ever read a dream of Angus Og. And if ever he got the sense that clearly Russell looks, you'll get lots of people who are very skeptical. And I have to try and create some balance when I write about these things. I have to create, you know, I have to give both sides of the argument. People say, look, the sunlight came in the doorway. So people pre excavation could see sunlight in the passage. But the fact that they were very specific about where the light landed is a memory of something ancient. Russell, just takes it all. Uh, Russell said that he could see the other world. He could see the many colored land, the hollow beneath the hollow hills. He painted the two at Adan and they were wonderfully radiant and full of light. Uh, I, I, I find that actually such uh, incredible uh, prose that uh, I find even the reading of it to be a, a tremendously moving experience. Uh, and uh, you'll probably know because I've done a lot of talking in the last 79 episodes it's uh, <sighs> I'm speechless so I, I did a version of that set to music a number of years ago which uh, you can watch on watch the Vimeo version the YouTube version doesn't have the same quality of editing, uh, which I invite you to watch afterwards. And I, I think now I'm going to do a full version. I have to do a full version of it. I mean, it's out of copyright, so there's no issue with copyright. I need to do the whole thing. I did a synopsis, uh, not a synopsis, I, I did snatches of it uh, with images of Newgrange, old and new. And uh, it's wonderfully evocative, you know. Um, and I think I need to do that now. I think I need to go back and create a, a longer version. Do you know what? As much as anything as a tribute to George William Russell, uh, who has, I have to be honest, has been a, a, huge, uh, uh, a huge influence to me. In fact, I quoted his uh, poem, Earth from Earth, uh, which I think is the last chapter of Candle of Vision. I quoted uh, that uh, verse of that at the beginning of the epilogue of the Drone Henge book and at the end. Um, and I just thought it was very appropriate. I think that he, 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 he's very um, idealistic. And you know what? I love that about him. I love the fact that he was idealistic, actually. I think we should all strive to be idealists. And I think people put people down for being idealists and, you know, put labels on you and put you into boxes. But idealists are the visionaries and the poets and the druids of their time. They are the ones who see the bigger picture. They are the ones who see into the other world and who are able to draw from it. 
And I'm sure that Russell led a very charmed uh, and a very magical life, actually, I'm sure. I haven't written, read his biography, but um, Jim Conway, I think, um, knows a bit about um, A.E. because A.E. was born up Jim's neck of the woods. Um, yeah, geez, I tell you, it's not, it's really, it's powerful. So David Clark as well. Hello, David. Con us a thought too. Uh, I've nothing left to say. I just, um, I actually found it difficult to hold it together a couple of times. I hope I, hope I concealed it enough. I, I was just on the verge of bursting out with this sort of great joy, actually, mostly. It's a very, very joyous uh, thing. Um. It's a very, I, I think that Russell was one of those people who, who was, as far as I'm concerned, an eternal optimist. He saw the very best in, in everything and the very best outcomes. E even if in life, you know, li life was showing you something else. They say the same about um, uh, Eula says, uh, James Joyce and Joyce and Russell knew each other, I'm pretty sure, that, you know, despite some of the things you'll read in Joyce, Joyce was, at the end of it all, an optimist. He believed in the optimism of things. It's making me seriously think that at someday I should just abandon all sort of reason uh, and go with my intuition and read from beginning to end Return to Segish uh, as a series of episodes because that's another work that's just kind of bursting to get out there. Anyway, uh, maybe to close, I'll, I'll quote uh, uh, Russell's poem, Earth. Uh, hopefully I'll remember it without uh, too much prompting. I think I've read it before. I've read it in one of my videos, perhaps not on the live. And uh, hopefully I can hold it together till the end. Don't forget that tomorrow night our episode is about the reconstruction of Newgrange. I'm going to give you my opinion about that. And especially I'm going to talk about the sort of claims that are made by people when they see the old versus the new pictures. In the meantime, I just want to say thanks to all the patrons of Mythical Ireland, who I sometimes forget to mention. Uh, you're very kind, and I'm very grateful for your support. And that's over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. So here goes, hopefully. I have it open in front of me, but hopefully I can read it without. It's been a while since I recited it. It's a short poem, so don't expect too much. No sign is made while empires pass. <laughs> the flowers and stars are still his care. The constellations hid in grass, the golden miracles in air. Life in an instant will be rent when death is glittering, blind and wild. The heavenly brooding is intent to that last instant on its child. It breathes the glow in brain and heart. Life is made magical until body and spirit are apart. The everlasting works its will. In that wild orchid that your feet in their last falling shall destroy their next falling shall destroy, minute and passionate and sweet. The mighty master holds his joy. And this is the one that I love the most. And in relation to Drone Henge, I thought it was brilliant. Though the crushed jewels droop and fade, the artist's labors shall not cease. And from the ruins shall be made some yet more lovely masterpiece.